Good morning, uh, Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, uh, dear colleagues. Thank you all for coming today. Uh, I am delighted to launch Big Ideas, the IES Distinguished Speaker Series. In this series, uh, we are going to invite some of the world's top thinkers, decision makers, and global leaders to share with us their unique perspectives with our ambassadors, many of them that are around the table today, with the IEA uh, experts and viewers around the world. This very session is being televised uh, around the uh, world. We hope that uh, this series will provoke discussions and uh, conversations about critical energy issues, climate change issues, and their reflections on economic development and social issues. As you all know, uh, in just 27 days, less than a month, there is a key United Nations Climate Change Conference here in Paris. And we expect many of the world's heads of state to attend. In these final days, or final weeks, of uh, the COP, we are very fortunate that a very distinguished speaker has taken time out of her schedule to speak to us today, to share with us her expectations and hopes for the summit and well beyond. Of course, I am referring to our inaugural speaker, Mrs. Mary Robinson, president of Mary Robinson Foundation Climate Justice. She was the first woman president of Ireland from 1990 to 1997. She is currently the UN Secretary General's Special Envoy on Climate Change. And she is a former, again, UN High Commissioner for Human Rights. Many of us know Mrs. Robinson uh, with all these uh, uh, works and her achievements. She is also a former chair of the Council of Women world leaders and the past president of Club of Madrid. Mrs. Rebenson uh, has received uh, several uh, numerous honors for her tireless work in advocating for human rights, which includes the Presidential Medal of Freedom from President Obama and the Sydney Peace Prize. As an executive director who is lucky enough to have 13 Irish colleagues, uh, they are bringing a lot of color to our work uh, in addition uh, to uh, other things, I learn an Irish expression. And I will try to uh, uh, pronounce it, uh, 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 Your Excellency. It is Ersko Akaila Avarimdit. Is it okay? Okay, yes. perfect. Thank you very much. <laughs> Which translates for the colleagues, few of you who don't speak uh, uh, Gaelish, <laughs> it means we live in each other's shadows. Once again, we live in each other's shadows. I think that anyone, uh, anyone who has followed uh, Mrs. Mary Robinson will agree with me that this perfectly captures her career-long work on improving the lives and dignity of underprivileged people. She has been a truly transformative figure in Ireland and inspiration to many worldwide. I can talk many things about Mrs. Robinson, but if I can add something, which uh, I gather from the discussions I had the privilege twice uh, today, she has a heart for the poor. I think this is perhaps as important as many uh, prizes she has received uh, across the world. 
We have invited uh, Mrs. Robinson to speak to us today because, as you know, the energy sector is at the heart of the climate change. It is responsible two-thirds of the emissions which cause uh, climate change. And at the same time, it is essential for the economic growth and social justice. We are uh, approaching the uh, COP meeting, and uh, there are good news. More than 150 countries submitted their pledges to United Nations to say how they are going to deal with a uh, climate change problem. And they cover more than 90% of the emissions uh, uh, worldwide. And most of those pledges are based on improving energy efficiency and having a higher share of renewable energy in their mix. These pledges, together with the increasing engagement of the energy industry, are helping to build the necessary political momentum around the globe to seal a successful climate agreement in Paris. We will look to leaders from around the world to help to build this momentum. And we, as the IEA, can only hope that they will be as tireless and as committed as our guest today. With those words, please, ladies and gentlemen, join me in welcoming Mrs. Mary Robinson. Thank you very much for that warm introduction and for inviting me here today. Um, it is uh, a real pleasure to address such a distinguished audience of ambassadors and of staff of the IEA. I'm honored to be the first speaker in the International Energy Agency's Big Ideas Seminar Series. And before I begin, I would like to warmly congratulate Fatih Birol on his recent appointment as the agency's executive director. We met in May when you came to Dublin, and uh, I think it's a mutual admiration society now. <laughs> uh, as a number of you will know, in 1878, Paris hosted the first international exposition of electricity as part of the World Fair hosted in the city that year. Paris was humming with excitement as inventors and innovators from around the globe came to exhibit their big ideas that would drive a new era of human development. New technology like the telephone, the dynamo, and the phonograph were on display. However, the star of the show was undoubtedly Thomas Edison, in Paris to exhibit his electric light bulb. Electric lighting had been installed all along the Avenue de l'Opera and the Place de l'Opera. When the switch was flipped, electric lighting flooded the streets and France had stepped into the age of electric energy. Parisians were very keen to e embrace electrification, but electricity was expensive. At the beginning, it was only the very wealthy who could afford access. In fact, it wasn't until 1937, nearly 60 years after the first international exposition of electricity, that an innovative financing mechanism enabled rapid spread of access to electricity throughout rural parts of France. A month from now, as you know, Paris will again play host to an international gathering as world leaders meet in an effort to arrive at an ambitious, fair, and legally binding agreement to limit climate change. While we don't know the finer details of the agreement yet, we do know that access to sustainable energy will be critical to the successful implementation of any new climate agreement. Those of us living and working throughout the developed world take access to modern energy for granted. We forget, or perhaps we've never known, the drudgery that access to energy removes from daily life. But today, 137 years after that international exposition of electricity here in Paris, there are, by the International Energy Agency's own figures, 1.3 billion people 
living in energy poverty. For me, this is an intolerable failure of human solidarity. Energy is the engine of development. It brings life-transforming benefits, lighting for schools, functioning health clinics, pumps for water and sanitation, cleaner in inner indoor air due to a decrease in cooking on open fires, and greater income-generating opportunities. It's imperative that all people have access to productive energy. And yet, our traditional means of generating energy, so heavily dependent on the burning of fossil fuels, is driving us to the brink of a global catastrophe. Climate change requires us to fundamentally rethink how we power our societies. Our tried and tested development paradigm is totally unsustainable. According to the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, average global surface temperatures have already risen by as much as 0.8 degrees Celsius since the late 19th century. And this increase is having a devastating impact on vulnerable communities around the world, and that I have witnessed personally. What's more, the impacts of climate change are being felt hardest by those people who've done the least to cause the climate crisis. Recurrent drought in the Sahel in Africa, intense flooding in South Asia, more intense tropical cyclones in the South Pacific, those who have benefited the least from fossil fuel development find themselves on the front lines of climate change. This is an injustice. As many of you may know, I'm honored to serve, and this was mentioned in the introduction, as the UN Secretary General Special Envoy on Climate Change. But today, I'm here as president of the Mary Robinson Foundation Climate Justice. Climate justice links human rights and development to achieve a people-centered approach, safeguarding the rights of the most vulnerable and sharing the burdens and benefits of climate change and its resolution equitably and, fa and fairly. Climate justice demands that the global community come together to solve two interdependent challenges. We must enable development for all people. However, we must achieve this at a time when the whole world needs, by 2050, to reduce global carbon emissions to zero. Not net zero carbon emissions, not carbon neutrality, but zero carbon emissions by 2050. Only this will give us the best possibility and the best possible chance of staying below the globally agreed target of two degrees Celsius while keeping the window of opportunity open to stabilize warming below 1.5 degrees. Energy is at the heart of the solution to both of these challenges. The overriding priority for developing countries is development, and development requires energy. If affordable, sustainable alternatives are not made available, developing countries will turn to fossil fuels as the only option available to them. And who could blame them? They need to lift their people out of poverty, improve public services, and power their economies, just as the developed world has done. However, this would rapidly deplete what's left of the global carbon budget and render all efforts at climate mitigation futile. I sometimes feel that it's worth thinking about the Titanic when it hit the iceberg. It wasn't just the poor in steerage who went down. It was first class as well. Everybody went down, and we're in a little bit of that situation. We would be on course to a world marked by catastrophic climate change and unimaginable human suffering. We must recognize that climate policy being crafted today by decision makers in developing countries will have implications for decades to come. As you well know, a decision to build a coal-fired plant is a 30 to 40 year commitment. We only need to look around Europe to see how difficult it is to wean a nation off its addiction to coal. Here in France, the three coal-fired power plants still in operation are all over 30 years old. In Germany, 27% of emissions are as a result of coal. In fact, coal still accounts for about 17% about of all European emissions. Developed countries cannot simply insist that poorer countries refrain from using fossil fuels on account of climate change. Instead, they must provide feasible alternatives. In the spirit of global solidarity and self-interest, all countries need to work together 
to enable an inclusive transition to a zero carbon and zero poverty future. To reach this future, all countries should show leadership today. But this leadership differs depending on a country's circumstances. Obviously, developed countries must rapidly peak and reduce their carbon emissions and reduce them really significantly. However, they must also make good on their commitments to support action in developing countries because it's only this support that will enable decision makers in developing countries to avoid locking their nations into fossil fuel development pathways. What is being asked of developing countries is the greater challenge, that they must lead the world in pioneering untested sustainable development pathways. It is worth remembering that no country has fully developed without fossil fuels. Those countries that have developed are now moving to renewables, but they used fossil fuels, and we're asking developing countries, if possible, to do it with no emissions. To achieve this, unprecedented levels of solidarity and support, including climate finance and transfer of technology, are essential. Yet, enabling renewable energy development to be the global norm is only the first part of the challenge. We must also devise innovative and people-centered strategies to ensure that the benefits of access to this sustainable energy reach all people, including those in the most vulnerable situations. As was repeated in New York for the Sustainable Development Co Goals, no one must be left behind. The 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development provides a framework through which such a people-first approach can be achieved. The Sustainable Development Goals include, as you know, a dedicated energy goal, Goal 7, recognising the central importance of energy access to ending poverty and enabling development. I served as UN High Commissioner for Human Rights when the Millennium Development Goals were adopted, and I must say it was a significant oversight that they did not include energy. Um, the first target of Goal 7 reads, by 2030, ensure universal access to affordable, reliable, and modern energy services. This is a very ambitious target, and one which I wholeheartedly endorse. But I'd like to highlight a worrying discrepancy between that target and the current outlook of the International Energy Agency. The IEA's latest Africa Energy Outlook forecasts that by 2040, 10 years beyond 2030, more than half a billion people in Africa will still not have access to electricity. This throws down a challenge to all of us gathered here today. In order to realize universal access to sustainable energy by 2030, the global community must understand the barriers to energy access for the poorest and most marginalized people. Tackling energy poverty is not simply about the ambitious expansion of electricity capacity. Countries must pioneer innovative solutions that deliver energy services to very poor people. The reality is, just as it was in France 100 years ago, energy access is simply prohibitively expensive for many. Concerted efforts will be required to target the very poorest, those who will not be reached by business as usual, as they lack the disposable income to meet the upfront costs of energy access. For the poorest peoples and communities, access to sustainable energy should be viewed as an enabler of positive development outcomes. As such, it should be considered a public good in much the same way as education, healthcare, and public infrastructure. As the theme of this speaker series is big ideas, I'd like to provide one concrete idea that I believe has the potential to make significant inroads into e energy poverty. Let's consider the potential of providing renewable energy access through social protection systems. Typically, the beneficiaries of social protection programs include the chronically poor and those who are economically vulnerable. They also constitute a significant portion, proportion of those who currently have no access to electricity. Therefore, countries with existing social protection systems have already identified the people whose energy needs are greatest and have the infrastructure and delivery mechanisms in place to reach them in a targeted way. I learned this when I sat in on a donor meeting in Addis Ababa some years ago for the uh, Ethiopian 
productive safety net system, which was a government program but funded by donors from um, different, particularly European countries, Irish Aid, German, um, DFID, etc. And I learned that the productive side of it was labor, that the very poor would um, give time for good environmental activities like planting trees, water management, etc. And in return, they would get a goat or some chickens, but not energy. I think that has now changed in that um, particular project because we had a good discussion, but it was, it was interesting that energy wasn't part of the mix. So the full potential of such a delivery me mechanism is yet to be explored, but some countries are testing the idea. In 2012, I visited Malawi and discussed the potential of coupling renewable energy access and social protection with the government officials and the bilateral donors there. The government of Malawi has since set a target of delivering two million energy efficient cookstoves to households by 2020. In conjunction with Irish Aid and Concern Universal and other um, aid donors, the government is piloting a project to deliver cookstoves to the poorest households, utilizing a social cash transfer delivery mechanism. By the end of 2015, the program will have reached 8,400 homes. That may not sound great, but the program will then be scaled up to 320,000 homes by the end of 2016. Social protection systems can deliver at scale if supported by genuine political will and appropriate financing. Adopting this innovative approach for delivering sustainable energy solutions could drastically reduce energy poverty. Before I conclude, let me say something about the importance of a human rights framing for both development action and climate action. Climate justice demands that we consider the impacts of climate change and responses to climate change on people, their rights and their livelihoods. The wealth being created globally through largely fossil fuel based development is concentrated in the hands of a few and those who are vulnerable, excluded and politically disempowered are getting poorer. Oxfam's most recent statistics on global inequality are truly shocking. By 2016, the richest 1% of the population will own more than all the rest. If measures are not taken to ensure that the transition to zero carbon is more equitable and more inclusive than business as usual, it will have failed even before it begins. A human rights approach provides the framework necessary for success. As opportunities arise in this transition to sustainable development, it's imperative that investors and businesses respect human rights in their investments, operations, and supply. This pertains to the provision of energy serv services too. To ensure that the transition to zero carbon bolsters human rights rather than undermining them, all business activity should abide by the UN guiding principles on business and human rights and the UN principles of responsible investment. These should be reflected in robustly implemented environmental, social and governance cri criteria, ESG criteria, that include <coughs> climate justice considerations. The elders, a group brought together uh, some years ago by Nelson Mandela, to which I have the honor to belong, recognized the positive significance of the rapid increase in investment in renewable energy in Africa. I'm sure you're aware of the number of projects now for um, renewable energy in Africa. We, the elders, will be encouraging responsible investing there, precisely because a rapidly growing market can see problems, problems of land grabs and lack of respect for human rights. Transparent practices and meaningful engagement with civil society is necessary to ensure that the transition leaves no one behind. This is particularly true of the, for the inclusion of women. The provision of renewable energy services must empower women as actors in their own development and enable them to build resilience to climate change. The impacts of climate change are different for women and men. Women are likely to bear a far greater burden due to existing gender inequalities. And in many countries, women are at the forefront of the injustices caused by climate change. So in conclusion, and before I hope we can have a good um, um, discussion and, 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 and debate, um, I want to return to the World Fair, which was held in Paris in 1878. Sadly, that World Fair was overshadowed by the excitement surrounding the electric light bulb. And there was another invention 
Augustin Mouchot, a Frenchman, unveiled a solar-powered engine. He won a gold medal for his efforts. But with coal in the ascendancy and no awareness of environmental harms associated with burning fossil fuels, the French government deemed solar energy to be uneconomical and ended Mouchot's funding. How different things might have been if they had known then what we know now and had committed to solar energy. Next month, a successful climate agreement in Paris would send a powerful signal to policymakers around the world, signifying the coming to an end of an e the era of fossil fuels and triggering a new sustainable energy revolution. Perhaps more than any other problem humanity has faced, climate change confronts us with the reality of our interdependence. It's as morally unacceptable to allow uncontrolled climate change to happen as it is to tolerate the existence of extreme poverty in the 21st century. Addressing the intertwined challenges of enabling development and tackling climate change will require genuine vision and innovation. Just as the International Electricity Exposition in Paris heralded a new era of human history, so too must the Sustainable Development Goals, which as you know come into effect on the 1st of January 2016. They must trigger a just transition to zero carbon, climate resilient societies with sustainable energy ac accessible to all. It's no doubt one of the greatest challenges in the history of humanity. However, I like the spirit of Thomas Edison, who was the champion in Paris in 1878. And he said, if we did all the things we are really capable of doing, we would literally astound ourselves. Thank you very much.